Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week sees the return of one of the show's most popular guests, Lionel Snell, aka Ramsey Dukes. Earlier this year, Lionel released a fascinating book, My Year of Magical Thinking, which went straight to the top of my teetering to read pile, and, thanks to one of the few upsides of long haul travel, finally got moved to the red pile. Lionel returns to answer my many questions about it. Lionel, aka Mr. Dukes, welcome back. Oh, thank you. It's a Wonderful. pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> well, we were just commiserating <laughs> before I hit the record button uh, about the time it takes to both uh, write a book and uh, and indeed read them. And uh, and for me, I um, I was actually saving your book for the flight to LA, and uh, and I got that under the way. But um, congratulations for getting a book out this year. I'm glad one of us did. Uh, mm. And um, I have a whole bunch of, I think, um, interesting questions, because this was, um, for someone who, I, I hesitate to say, grow, grew up with your books, but in a way I did. Um, mm. for, for me, in many respects, uh, the latest work is, is a book in its own right, but it was also some interesting cheat notes for me in, in kind of correlating where, um, where I now think maybe some of your ideas came from. So uh, mm. it was a fascinating read, and uh, and congratulations. Mm. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, um, I'm going to yeah. just jump on in with some of the questions that I scrolled down during the turbulence. Uh, mm. Question well, one. Oh, one, yeah, thing, go on. one thing I, I might sort of explain is you know, the reasons for writing what might seem like just a sort of expansion of sosopomy after all these years. And it's that um, I've been very much... Uh, in the company of people who, in my terms, are religious, you know, in other words, they're politicians, academics, and people who are properly religious, Muslims and Christians, a lot of those in South Africa. And there's very little sort of uh, comprehension or really wanting to know about magic. And so I tend to keep it quiet. You know, I don't tell people I'm interested in magic. And um, so that if ever I am asked to give a talk or to explain to someone i have to go through the whole business you know explaining that to me it's a, a sort of different way of looking at the world and so on and so forth and unless they're frightfully interested that's pretty boring and that's so i i envy people if i think of um people who have ideas you know uh, uh richard um dawkins uh, dawkins yeah that's it um people like that who they can stand up and say refer to things like um, relativity or uh, natural selection. And they don't have to go and spend 15 minutes explaining to everyone what those mean. They can just talk about those things and people go along with it. And they can get onto something new. And I just thought, if only there was a book out there where I could say it's all in there, you know, um, and let's talk about something that goes beyond that. So that really was what I was trying to write, a book that would be more generally published and more generally read. Um, so that I wouldn't have to sort of go back over and over again, this old stuff. And that's why I was, uh, you know, writing it not specifically for magicians, but for a general public. But it, I ended up publishing it myself. So I just thought I'd explain that, you know, that um, uh, sort of give it a context. Well, sure. Interestingly, one of the uh, questions I have here is who did you write this book for because i got the impression it yes. wasn't for me and i mean i don't mean me specifically yeah. uh mm. it was it was really interesting to as, as you do if you if you write like you think well who's in his head as he's writing this and yeah. uh, and that, yeah. that clarifies some interesting things see in the um like when i first became known it was to the the chaoists in the north of england and um so about once a year i'd be asked to give a talk and i look at the audience a lot of familiar faces there now that's nice but it means that i felt i had to think up something new every time which was very stimulating now it's interesting because pete carroll said something like that to me recently he said it was pretty hard work yeah people expected some brilliant new concept every time we spoke to them um but when um with print on demand my book started going out um I was sort of known enough to people occasionally ask me to give a talk, but I look at the audience and a whole lot of people, fresh faces, you know, that I'd never seen before. And I always felt I had to go back and explain myself from the beginning again each time. 
And that became very tedious. And that's the sort of thing, you know, <laughs> I wanted to get back to actually thinking of new things if my brain isn't too old to do that. Well, that's... Uh Okay, so I'm just going to jump to one of the questions uh, towards the mm. end based on what you just said there, which um, towards the end of the book, you describe it as a summary of your early thoughts. Is it a summary mm. of your early thoughts? Well, in the sense that um, Sosopomy was the first um, book that I published, and it's very much sort of building on that. But actually, you no, know, you're right. It um, uh, it was right up to date in the sense that anything that followed from that, um, I, I tended to add in, you know, when I was trying to sort of update it, particularly in the final chapters. So it summarizes my early thoughts, but um, has extrapolated from them some of the, many of the things which has occurred to me since. Well, yeah, that was going to be my question because uh, it's uh, it's a large book, and I thought, hang on, is he doing a series? Is he going to do like mm. early Lionel, mid Lionel, <laughs> <laughs> late Lionel? Because that's a lot of books. Spare me that. Spare yeah. me that. <laughs> <laughs> mm. All right. Mm. So, um, in uh, towards the beginning, you say something which I really resonate with, and and I would like to discuss. You describe magic as, and it's maybe one of the changes from early thoughts to late thoughts, but you describe it as post scientific rather than pre scientific. Yes. Now, what do you mean by yes. that? Well, um, partly this is sort of observation that um, uh, what I have not seen in my own life and in my sketchy knowledge of history what i've not seen is sort of a world of magic and then along comes science and everyone um drops magic what i've seen again and again is that um science uh reaches a certain level of ubiquity and then it's followed by a magical revival now in a sense that happened to me just you know i i had this uh education i was doing physics and mathematics and all that um but when i got to cambridge i discovered um, good access to the works of Crowley. And so my interest in magic um, soared at that point. Now, a similar thing happened, you know, um, the 50s I described as very much a materialist scientist um, worldview, but then we followed it with the hippie re magical revival. The same thing happened in Victorian times. Um, you know, there was a, a time when um, uh, you would go to a theatre and uh, you would go to see science demonstrated, you know, it was, it was the great wow factor. Um, and then a few years later, you had the um, turn of the century and decadence and the magical revival, typified by the golden dawn. And when I look back, I said that something, you see, the question I, I addressed in my book is, people say, whatever happened to the Enlightenment? We've had five centuries of rationality, humanity, you know, sensible, logical, proper education. Why are people suddenly getting interested in astrology and all this mumbo jumbo? And what occurred to me is that um, the same thing happened. You know, the Greek uh, philosophy, Greek science, uh, Greek culture was based on rationality and hum all the things that were actually revived in the Enlightenment. And yet it was followed by the Roman era, uh, where we saw the birth of our modern astrology, alchemy, divination, so many things which um, uh, we now consider to be magical practices actually flourished at that time. And so that was on the one hand, I saw it as um, something which I observed. And then when I started to think, now why is that? I touch on several reasons in the book. And one is that um, the scientific well, tends to increase complexity. Now, trying to tackle complexity with linear, what one might call uh, left brain thinking, um, you know, logical thinking, there's a limit to that. And when people reach that limit, um, the next step is to actually use right brain magical thinking to address complexity. And the sort of very naive example I gave was. Um, you know, the little kid, uh, the infant on his high stool, he pushes the spoon to the edge, of his, uh, the edge of his plate and it falls to the floor. And it does that regularly every time. You know, he's learning 
what is mechanical and predictable in the world. Now, mother comes and picks it up and puts it back. So she too seems to be mechanical and predictable. And yet he begins to see that something more complex is happening because she doesn't always do it on time. And sometimes she looks cross and sometimes she takes a spoon and washes it. And how does one explain that? Now, one way is you go down the scientific route and you, route and you say, well, everything is mechanical ultimately. And you just have to find how to press her buttons to make her work. You know, a sort of laboratory creature test. The other is you say, maybe there's a, there's a me inside her, you know, another consciousness in there. Now, that is actually a very sophisticated step because what you're doing in religious terms, you're trading your soul with the entity. You're saying you're putting yourself into that other thing and think, what would I do? I might have bad moods or I might be feeling grumpy. And to me, that's one of the key things of magical thinking. Um, to look at the world and think that, for instance, the weather might have moods and to start thinking in terms of the moods and what the weather wants and what it's trying to tell you and things like that. Um, it's the idea of actually seeing spirits around you rather than dead matter. And the argument actually I put in um, you know, uh, the little book of demons is that um, whereas we used to say man the tool maker, you know, the great thing that gave humans the um, big brains advantage was we learned to use tools. But now we know that the crows and um, other creatures use tools and that the real growth seemed to come with socializing um, and the language and uh, the ability to sort of form group minds. And that was really when the brain seemed to take off. Now, I know it's just another theory, but it's one that sort of makes more sense to me. And in those terms, treating the world mechanistically is a sort of dumbing down, whereas to um, a tackle complexity by putting your mind into it and sort of exploring it from within um, is actually a more sophisticated and it's an advance on the scientific way of looking at things. Well, that so, was, yeah, um, yeah. F that was mm. for me the, the resonance, which is, um, I mean, it, it's interesting. And one of the things I found very pleasant about the book was when you talk about ideas like science and magic, you, you kind of correctly hand wave, like we're simplifying some concepts here. And it, it's the same thing, you know, we were just talking about. Mm. But when we talk about science in this context, we are talking about a, a Cartesian materialist worldview mm. and and in that sense yeah. i think magic is post-scientific because here we are at the beginnings or even a third of the way through um the 21st century and the mm. limitations of that uh like a materialist cartesian worldview are evident and I, and for me mm. uh, and interestingly i don't know if you're f um, familiar with charles fort's models of of how civilization progresses. I was waiting to see if it was uh, in the book, but he calls them dominance mm -hmm. as opposed to eras. And even in oh, the early yeah, 20th yeah. century, he was referring to a dominant of science giving way to the dominant of witchcraft, because he saw oh, yeah. that mm. the the, um, the descriptive model had reached its limitations in his day. I mean, he spent his mm. time collecting weird events that happened, and he's like, well, these oh, fall yes, outside yeah. science. Mm. And I just mm. was really... Magic as as a post scientific uh, cognitive solve um, really resonates with me. Mm. That's interesting. I I was always aware of um, Fort, you know, having read or oh, things like the Dawn of the Magicians and like that, but I never um, sort of followed it up. I never really had time to pursue it. Um, and I know the Fortean Society, you know, is still has its Fortean Times and that. And I think, you know, given another life, <laughs> I'd love to know more about it because that is very interesting what you said. And it certainly resonates with what I, I see. So um, is that, uh, have, have we sufficiently described magical thinking, do you think? Or what do you, how do you conceive of magical oh. thinking? Oh, never. Um, I mean, you know, I gave that as one example. That's a, that's a, a key thing, you know, the, um, uh, the ability to sort of look at systems and that as their potential for living, to be living and to some extent conscious. Now, it doesn't mean that they're speaking English and, you know, sort of just like your own brain, but 
in the sense that I think scientists are beginning to say that um, a, you know, squids, um, octopuses, snails, all these things have brains. And so to, in some sort of manner, they could be conscious entities. You know, we, we can't just say everything's dumb except for humans, which really is a sort of inherited from the religious tradition to think that. Um, so in that sense, I think I sort of see intelligence out there everywhere. Um, and that is one key thing in magical thinking. Um, uh, the other elements are the sense of connectedness. Um, that uh, you see, science would say, how ridiculous to look at tea leaves in a cup to find out about your life. It's just a chance event. How ridiculous to look at the planets to find out, you know, um, uh, patterns in your life. They're lumps of matter millions of miles away. You know, there's absolutely no connection there. Now, one of the attractions for me when I came up with the, the view that we're living in a virtual reality is that um, connectedness would be absolutely inherent in a virtual reality because to make things independent and random is one of the biggest challenges in a um, computer system. You know, generating random numbers, you really generate pseudo random numbers or else you use some trick based on the sort of limitations of silicon chips um, so that uh, it would be an extraordinary waste of processing power to make all those separate things totally independent they would actually be generated from the same software they would um, be linked and the real interesting thing is is how the illusion of separateness arises you know um, and to me consciousness is, is part of that so uh, that to me is a, is a magical view of the universe um, where everything is linked but maybe the links are so subtle or the language is so difficult you know that you can't actually read it but in theory um, you could look at any phenomenon and uh, learn about the whole world, a sort of, you know, whole world in a grain of sand type of thing. And I've, that to me is um, certain levels of that, I think, are in any magical thinking. You know, you can shuffle a pack of cards to find out about your life. You can look at the um, planets. You can do something in a little uh, cell uh, in your little temple that could have an effect across the rest of the world and so on. So that sense of an inherent connectedness, much more than would be admitted by science, is another key thing in magical thinking. And again, it's a sort of embracing of complexity. See, that science needs to separate these things in order to make them simple enough to deal with. Um, I give the example of, you know, like uh, trying to detect um, cold fusion, energy of cold fusion. Now, uh, they didn't look at the, the, um, where the planets were to do that, or um, they didn't study the psychology of the people making the experiments, because they'd say, well, that's irrelevant. Those factors are too small to be considered. Now, in a magical sense, everything is considered. Everything plays a role. And so you have to use a much broader way of looking at things in order to sort out what are the significant ones and what are not. Um, so... Uh, Gosh, I almost forgot what the question was. Yeah, well, the, <laughs> yeah. We're, yeah, we're, we're the differences for, of magical thinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so. and a, a general mm. definition of it. Because mm. one of the things, uh, and I guess it does come down to how we use the term science and, and, and what we use to describe it in this book. But you, you say something which I'm not sure I agree with, um, mm. which is that the public's understanding of scientific culture is better than magical culture. And and just to go back to your example there of things like the tea leaves and, and connectivity, mm. I... Um, when when we, If we say scientific culture is in... Uh, uh, opinion pieces in the Guardian. It's 19th mm. century materialism that's more or less falsified. Mm. So it's just interesting to me to have uh, a connectivity-based thinking on the back foot when the mm. uh, the premise is going. You don't really think that, do you? That um, emerge with someone having that perspective are falsified. And I'm just wondering if oh, people. Yeah. Uh, mm. I, and in that sense, when you talk about a public's understanding of scientific culture, if it is that, if it's this kind of 
um, dickish Victorian buzzkill gentleman in a in a waistcoat um, calling superstition on on the brown people around him. Um, I don't think that's mm. science anymore, and it's weirdly because you've studied physics, and um, I have yes. physicists in my family. And if I ask them what's going on with reality, and then they'll, well, mm. what I currently think is, and then they'll go Bleh, and. Uh, it's mental. It's this connective mm. holographic, uh-huh, you know, yes, and it's yes. it's completely magical. And I just mm. I don't think I don't think the public's understanding is is where science is. I think the the public understanding is yes. is of this sort of Victorian scientism. And yes. I'm just wondering if yes. you think that's valid. Yes, I think um you see what uh I would t- explain that in the terms just within my model that um Scientists themselves, you know, the, the thought um, is evolving towards magical thinking. Mm. And therefore, um, science itself is beginning to move towards that sort of holistic. Um, but uh, it leaves behind a culture which is, you know, oh, that, lo- that magic load of rubbish, you know, sort of Richard Dawkins type of um, dismissal, the skeptical culture, which. Um, if people were quoting something against magic, they would to say, well, it's been shown in laboratories, you know, that um, it's just chance and things like that. So I think that um, uh, there's a real sort of double standards here mm-hmm. that um, whereas when people are really doing science, they're beginning to reach towards this broader concept of the world and its connectivity. Um, when people start defending themselves against magical thinking, um, you know, uh, then they step back to saying, oh, well, you know, I want to see this proved in a laboratory and, um, you know, uh, uh, multiple tests show that it just simply isn't true and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, a shift is taking place and the question is whether it should be called science or yeah, the, that the, I, the, the new magic or something. It's, well, because um, I agree. I mean, you, you did physics <laughs> and mathematics. I'm um, weirdly, I, I kind of saw myself in a couple of places in the book, which was to be a pro science magician, which I am, but, a, mm. but mm. Uh, what I would describe as a correct understanding of science. And when mm. it falls outside of that, I am a terrorist for magic. Like I am, I am yeah. anti-scientism. <laughs> and so I sort of showed up yeah. twice in the, in the personality types that you're describing in the book there, because mm. I think maybe yeah. there is a new word for it. Well, yes. I, I think in yes. some sense we need to hold them accountable. If they're going to use the S word, I feel mm. like they should use it correctly. And as you point out, they uh, don't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe some yes. of that is psychological. So a yeah. lot of people don't want to live mm. in a, in a magical universe. Like mm. they don't. Uh, and I think people I think freak I could, out. I think I could draw an analogy with an earlier transition, you see, from religion towards the um, Enlightenment scientific view. Now, the people who began to say, um, uh, you know, the Bible doesn't have to be literally true to still be valuable and meaningful. Now, from the point of view of the sort of pure religious terminology, <laughs> they're, they're they were um what's the word they're heretics you know um that isn't religion um you know we know the bible is a world of truth and the people who began to sort of um develop what you might call a new religion um based on more on the ethical and moral aspects of it uh could be seen as um you know renegades um so uh, and yet now we accept that, you know, we accept that um, a religious person needn't be at all fundamentalist. Um, they can still be deeply religious. And I think that possibly something similar would happen with, with science, you know, that um, there's that sort of expectation that, oh, he has to be a total skeptic and um, has to believe everything's uh, pure chance. But actually, it's evolving out of that. As I say, we really need a sort of a new word. Yeah. Um, well, what's happening? You mentioned the Enlightenment again, and and you know, the question gets posed a couple of times in the book, which is whatever happened to the Enlightenment? And I was saving maybe mm. for the end of this podcast my answer to that, but I think now is the correct time for it. Which is, I think, science needs one because the Enlightenment oh, yes. emerged 
out of, as you just said, it's a, it's a, essentially a theological argument, which is that mm. creation can be wholly understood, which I don't agree with, but which creation mm. can be wholly understood by the human mind as, as, a, as an artifact essentially created mm. by God. So, mm. the Enlightenment scientists take all the good things, um, and mm. well, the, the story of science takes all the good things from magic and religion and, uh, and mm. decides it's theirs. And, and in, the Enlightenment I would describe as a religious phenomenon, and it's high time science had one. That's my answer to your question, yeah. Lionel. <laughs> yes, all right, yeah. Yes, that's nice, yeah. Mm. I think that... Um, uh, what was it? Something just occurred to me when you were saying that was that. Uh, oh, I think it slipped away. Um, mm. I'm sure it'll come back. No, up. It'll, it'll come back to me later. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So um, one of the things that I'm going to sit with for a while is this notion mm. of gamesmanship and the emergence of oh, yes. a sort of meta instance of game playing as as a kind of viewing of the sum of all games, if you will. So, so talk us through this notion, mm -hmm. this notion of gamesmanship, which is your window into the the model that you describe in the book. Yes. Um, well, my generation um, was, uh, you see, the previous generation was a generation that got us into war and was very politically aligned um you know people were communists or they were fascists and um and that led us into the sort of fervor of the second world war my generation uh each generation has to react against the past one and do something different my generation was born in really very good times and had a sort of playful attitude now, I begin the book with reference to Camus and um, the existentialist idea of sort of being absolutely in the moment, uh, experiencing what you're experiencing as it comes to you and not classifying it according to, you know, uh, some dogma that is, this is God's will or uh, whatever, some acceptable group explanation, but sheer experience, which I, I believe is called phenomenology but I, I, i'm not quite sure i haven't studied that um now along with that went a sense of well camus himself said that um Merceau, his hero refused to play the game in other words he could see that the conventions of society which said you must do this you must behave this way at your mother's funeral you must weep um this was conventions. It was a sort of game that one had to do in order to be accepted. Um, and he refused to play that game. Now, I think my generation took that up and saw the extent to which everything was a sort of game. You know, we, 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 I, I got a scholarship to public school and, um, you know, there's playing the public school game, you know, um, play up, play up and play the game and all that sort of thing. And, um, uh, the difference between a game and, uh, you see, the people in the Merso rebelled against, they didn't think they were playing a game. They thought that's real life. You know, you just don't do those things. But he saw it as a game. And so when you start seeing the conventions of society and some of its beliefs as sort of game plans, you get this feeling, well, you can change them. You could choose a different game plan, if you like. And I think a lot of that feeling went into the hippie movement. Um, you know, uh, make love, not war. Um, there was the world beginning to polarize into the same old patterns of, um, of hate and warfare and, you know, um, the communist versus the capitalist and Russia versus America and everything. And they sort of said, hey, that's just, you know, that's just old games. Let's instead um, play love and good vibes. Now, I related that to... Uh, the idea of the platonic idea that um, the world we experience, which is that phenomenology, if you like, the, the actual uh, what I feel in my body now, what I see, what's all around me, um, uh, is actually like shadows on the wall of a cave. And uh, what Plato taught us is if we turn round, instead of being caught up in those shadows, we turn round and see the light coming into the cave. 
and the real objects that are casting those shadows, we then know the truth. And I saw that having a sort of scientific explanation of the world was a platonic in that sense. You know, I might say that um, uh, I just seen a ghost. And the scientist of the sort of old school we've been talking about would say, ah, yes, now that's an illusion created within your brain because I could put you in the laboratory under certain circumstances and I could activate certain parts of your brain and you would see ghosts, you see. So that's all that happened. There wasn't any spirit out there. Now, um, so what they're doing is they're saying, We've turned around and we've seen the um, light come into the tunnel. We know the, the truth, the real world of atoms and molecules, which is actually causing these subjective experiences we have. Now, what struck me then about this sort of game playing thing is that uh, you actually have a choice of games. Now, for instance, um, it isn't considered to be true anymore that... Uh, uh, Atoms are made of like a little solar system, you know, with a nucleus and electrons buzzing around in, in orbits. That isn't actually uh, considered to be a literal truth. And yet you can do very good science on that model. And people have, for, you know, for years, um, there's a lot you can do in terms of chemistry if you sort of adopt that as your model. But there are other models you could adopt. Uh, yes, and that breaks down under certain conditions and certain types of science, you see. Um, someone else might say, Yes, it's just as the scientists describe. The only difference is it was created by a personal loving God. Um, there are so many variations on uh, what people consider to be the real truth that explains everything. Um, and some of those involve a spirit world or, or other dimensions. And so I suggested that one of the characteristics I saw amongst the people who um, call themselves magicians is that they are able to um, pick a, 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 platon a, a truth um, by choice as to what works best. Now, you see, um, if you decide to do your divination using astrology, uh, you're basing the universe on a duodecimal model. But if you use the E King, you're basing it on a binary model. Now, from a sort of strict platonic point of view one or other has got to be true but not not the other one um but most magicians could happily use the um uh, you know use astrology one day and use um yeking another day and get good results from both and not feel that they've done some terrible you know <laughs> that they've sort of done something terribly false in between and so uh it's like one chooses a particular game I gave the example of chess. Now, you take the chess board and the pieces on it, and you say, a knight can only make this move forward and to the side. And a skeptic would say, well, that's a load of rubbish. I could pick up that knight. I could put it anywhere. It doesn't even have to go onto one of the squares. It could go in between them. Um, if you take that skeptical view, this is totally ridiculous. But if you accept those rules and say, this is my truth while I'm playing chess, it's not just that you've fooled yourself into doing some silly little little bit of fantasy. Chess can actually become a, a life pursuit. It can be an inspiration. You know, it's a whole world that you open up when you accept the rules of chess. There's very limited things on a board of just 64 squares. And so I argue in a similar way that um, if you accept a first, a, if you choose a particular game, a particular sort of version of truth you can make a whole life out of it some of them don't work some of them break down you know are too paradoxical but um really uh, you can live your whole life on a different board if you like and um so i suggested that uh, whereas uh, plato had created a new layer over reality and i called it the truth layer you know what is the real truth behind all this the magicians had created another layer which i call the games layer which said there's a whole lot of truths there some of which work very well choose what truth you're going to use and choose it not no longer because which is really true but which one is going to work best which one adds most value to your life and in that sense many of the um sort of old ideas like a spirit world or 
plants that have davas and that, to me, add much more value to life than um, saying they're all just chemical reactions. Um, and so, yes, I suggest this idea of sort of a game playing approach is what we're increasingly doing. See, this is where I, um, where I had the, the subsequent question, uh, which we've we, we discussed, which is who the book is for, because I can kind of hear, uh, now, now that I know the, the backstory for how the book came to be, I, I can hear you mm. making this case to people who might be new to the idea of magical thinking, because my, yes. like, without, mm. whilst agreeing with everything you just said, my next two things that I would say, um, but not in that context where we're hypothetically in a room with people who want to know about magic and don't, is uh, mm. what about the game of gamesmanship? And also, in all these cases, and it comes back to that phenomenology, uh, mm. we are prioritizing, the, we're, we're saying that the only things that are real are the things that, um, and it's a, it's a Pete Carroll quote, speaking of which, uh, where he says, by a supreme act of selective in, uh, inattention, something like science or the modern world has uh, uh, only decided that the things that exist are physical or replicable. So, the, the kind of things, science only considers real the stuff that will um, show up every time you do it, rather than the, the sort of subjective component of it around it, which is the majority of experience. And that's why I like mm. the gamesmanship idea. It just seemed like a uh, it, it's it's a very uh, magician's attitude because it's also a, it's a willingness to play uh, a sum of all games rather than an, an mm. individual game. So it, you get into that pragmatism yes. of people who want to do. Uh, you know, who, who want to do actual sorcery with magic as well. So, so a really interesting, mm. really interesting way of framing how uh, different modes of being can be assessed. Hmm. Yes. I, I just um, on that, you see that um, I, I suggest you know the direction that these different cultures go in, and that um, uh, uh, the religious culture goes in a direction which. Um, it would call good the good. Um, now, of course, pe critics could say it's actually very bad, but um, no, I don't think religious people say I'm choosing to do something which is very bad. They all think that they're doing something which is godly and, and uh, following an ex godly example and therefore good. Um, science, um, in a similar way, the direction is towards truth. What is the actual fact here? What is the actual reality behind what I'm experiencing? And I suggest that magic is towards wholeness and so um what you're looking for is which ideas actually resonate with me and um enlarge my life and and make say make the world a better place but uh yeah sort of um uh you might put into crowleyan terms of which ideas lead me to my true will better or or whatever it's a sort of um you're not Truth is not the number one uh, priority anymore. It is what works for me. And, um, yeah, so uh, that's just another part of that sort of shift I'm seeing. And which direction, to round out the four cultures in your um, graph, which direction does art go in? I said towards beauty. Um, yeah, I think that's now, fair. It has to be you know, a very broad understanding of beauty because there's a sense in which sometimes something very ugly is beautiful. Because, okay, but I think that it, in a very broad sort of sense, beauty is, is what is being looked for. Something which sort of uh, presents things in a, beautifully summed up in a beautiful, complete sort of form. Yeah, yeah. I've, I struggle a bit with the art sector because it, it's sort of, it's so extraordinary to me, you know, what an artist can do, um, the transformation that an artist can make. Um, I give the example of the conceptual artist who placed a half full mug of water on a shelf in a gallery and called it an oak tree and explained how he had converted this glass of water into an oak tree. <laughs> and the whole explanation is so extraordinary. You realize. Any magician would be amazed if he could just take a glass of water and make it into an oak tree. And yet the artist has just done this with a stroke. Um, yeah, so, so art can do extraordinary things, which um, 
in a sense, go beyond anything magic can do um, at my level of ability. Mm. Yeah, it's. Um, I think beauty is fair if we if we're talking about the directionality of art. Um, mm. What what interested me, and well, I'm using that word too much. I'll, I'll say the opposite then. What initially frustrated me about the model, uh, the mm. the sort of uh, fourfold uh, graph, was that uh, I wanted to, and I think everyone does. Uh, I wanted to change it. I wanted to put different things elsewhere. Uh, but actually. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. What and sitting with the idea for a while made me realize, okay, so there's value in this as a model, like as as a way of thinking, mm. which is just uh, as it is. And and what sold it for me is like, okay, yes, but uh, religion emerged out of art, but the artistic movements in Europe emerged out of uh, you know the Renaissance, uh, broadly speaking, and mm. and the same thing. Uh, and I want to put magic at the bottom because everything came out of that. And I'm like, okay, this is why it works. Mm-hmm. This because it all oh, yeah. Um, yeah. if you if you imbalance towards one of the quadrants versus another, like mm. literally any of those four quadrants can make a case that it birthed the other three. Yes. Uh, so yes. that was where I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mm. sit with this. But what I liked yeah. about it, and I don't know if this was intentional, is um, because it's a, uh, it's you know, an X Y axis. And for people who you'll you find it on the page, but for people who haven't uh, mm. are unaware of what we're talking about, in each of the quadrants, you have science, art, magic, and you no know, science, art, magic, and religion. religion. What I liked yeah. about it was. Uh, Religion shares a full border with magic and a full border with art, but only a point with science, and obviously vice versa. And I don't know no, if that was it. Was it? Um, uh, yes, no, religion shares a full border with art and with science and a point with magic, which is why religious people find magic so very threatening. Um, that's, Are you sure about that? You think? Have I, have I got that wrong? Yes, it's M A R S. It's like Mars, my ruling planet. Um, right, gotcha. magic, art, religion, science was the cycle that I saw. Okay, yes. I must have been looking at that wrong because that maybe that's where mm. I was thinking I want to I want to switch them around. Mostly because whenever yes. um, every couple mm. of years you get artists or scientists saying, uh, you know, mm. usually scientists, art and science need to work together, and it's always an octoparrot abortion. Like it's terrible. Yeah. It's like when you go. <laughs> yeah. to, it's yeah. like when you go to the you know mm. um, hipster suburbs of London, and they have these kind of like mm. fake rationalist church get get togethers. It's just oh, yeah. disgusting. Yeah. It's the worst <laughs> yeah. of all worlds. And for me, I wanted yeah. um, you mm. know I wanted religion or at least maybe mm. art in the middle to share longer yeah. land borders with with magic and yeah. religion because I do think. Well, closer. Yes. Yeah. Now you see, I um, I started, you know, as a child with the duality, art and science, um, you know, which was the C. P. Snow's thing. So seeing those as opposites, and then it was, you know, I realised well, there's also they they've missed out magic, uh, they missed out uh, religion, and then later saying, well, there's another way of thinking which which I call magic. You know, where does that fit in? So that was sort of how it grew for me um, from. Uh, Art and science being the opposition. And then I realized I'd created another opposition, religion and magic. And, but the key thing which um, I quickly learned that I need to emphasize is that people tend to look at it and think I'm drawing four boxes, you know, four yeah. categories. And I say, no, this is four directions. And this is an example where magical categorization is not. Um, with separate boundaries in the way that religious and scientific categorization is, but it's fractal. And so you see, if someone says, you know, are you Protestant or Catholic? And you say both, they just wouldn't accept that. No, no. I mean, come on, which one are you really? Um, there's a very clear distinction there. Um, and not much is recognized to be on the boundary between the two. They've got things in common, but you know, either you're one or the other, you're either um, Sunni or you're Shia or whatever. Um, very clear boundaries there. And science too, if you sort of start talking about spirit, they will say, hang on, that isn't a, a well-defined concept. What do you mean by spirit? You know, it likes to have clear definitions, clear boundaries. Now, when it comes to magic, um, uh, take the tree of life. And there's a saying that every Sephiroth uh, contains every other one. Um, that uh, 
in astrology, um, you can think of each of the 12 signs in terms of a 12 fold evolution from the one sign to the other. Uh, that um, all these uh, earth, air, fire, water, Crowley breaks down into earth of earth, air of earth, fire of earth, water of earth, and so on. You can break this down indefinitely. Now, when you tell that to people, they say, but you can't think like that. If you don't have clear boundaries, this is, this is meaningless. And I point out that we have a fourfold classification called north, south, east, and west. And it is totally fractal in that sense. Because I live um, near Cape Town, which is surely a southern city. And yet there's just as much north in Cape Town as there is in London uh, or Oslo. Um, it's got a northern suburbs. Um, and you can go into the northern suburbs. You can say, well, this is the southern part of the northern suburbs. So that's the northern part. And you can say that's the east part and that's the west part. That there is another way of uh, classifying things, which is directional rather than, um, what's the term, categorical, if you like. Uh, and that um, magical thinking seems to rely more on that uh, right brain spatial sense um, than on the left brain needing clear categories and uh, uh, causality linking them up. Um, so that uh, sort of example I gave it, uh, to discuss this is, you know, is building a church an act of magic or an act of religion? Well, the fact that you get a place and lumps of stone and stuff and you put it together and you create a sacred space that actually is a, an act of magic you're bringing spirit down into ordinary matter and you're activating it if you like making it something magical make it into a power object so it's an act of magic building a church but why do you do it you do it so that um people could come out of their ordinary lives into that place and to some extent be lifted up to god in other words although um, magically, it's bringing spirit down into matter and making it um, something powerful and sacred. Uh, the actual purpose of it is that people can come, material people can come in and be lifted up to spirit, which is a direction for me that um, religion goes in. And so, um, sort of, you know, in just about every religious act, you can see elements of magic in it. And I even gave the example if you take a scientist. Um, and ask them why they're doing science they might say um, uh, I do it in order to disprove certain theories which I feel are dubious you know to find counter uh, to proof that uh, and therefore to get closer to the truth now that to me is a sort of a true scientific attitude if you say I'm doing it because um, I want to increase humanity's uh, knowledge of the truth and what's really behind reality, um, then to me, you're doing it in a rather religious spirit. Mm. If you do it saying, um, look, this, this whole sort of field is a mess, and I think there's probably some simple truth behind it all that I can help to find by doing the right experiments, you're doing it in a rather sort of artistic spirit. And then I gave the example that if you are, if you say something like, um, I'm doing this genetic engineering because I want to solve world hunger. You're actually doing it in a magical spirit. And uh, I justify that by saying solving world hunger is not a clearly defined scientific objective. And you will get some scientists who feel they've succeeded and others arguing they haven't. And I gave the example of the Green Revolution, you know, new types of wheat which can grow in, um, in tropical conditions. Now, people who did that probably felt very satisfied they'd done a lot to help solve world hunger. But other people say, rubbish, that was a disaster, because that type of wheat meant that countries which used to have um, a struggling but diverse agricultural system uh, now have become, gone into monoculture, making wheat, and that's reduced the cost of wheat across the world so much that they're, they're suddenly struggling and starving. You know. In other words, um, the outcome uh, is more subjective. And that is another factor, another feature of the um, magical thinking, which I, I, I should really just explain that. 
you know, if um, a group of magicians has a friend who's dying of terminal cancer and they do a healing ritual, now, on the other hand, they would love to go into the um, hospital the next day and discover there's been a complete rem remission and the guy is, you know, <laughs> walking around and perfectly healed. But what more typically happens is that um, there's a huge change in the person's outlook. You know, the guy who had been as miserable as hell and um, uh, dying, he says, you know, I realize I've got 12 months to live. So the first time in my life, I'm really going to live. I'm going to write that book I intended to write. I'm going to do this, that, and the other. I've always meant to. And those people would say, that healing ritual worked. It's taken him towards a sort of wholeness. In retrospect, they would recognize that the healing had worked. Now, from a scientific point of view, that's absolute border dash. You did a healing ritual, and the guy's still going to die. You haven't done anything. Just sort of changed attitudes a bit, but you didn't predict you were going to do that, did you? And so, uh, yeah, that's another factor we were talking about, you know, the differences of um, magical thinking. Magical thinking judges the success of an operation afterwards as to how subjectively it has um, made things more whole or improved things. And um, uh, yeah, so God, how did I get into that? <laughs> yeah, I was just giving that example that someone who says, I'm doing this science in order to solve world hunger or to um, uh, you know, <laughs> mean that Americans can feel safe in their beds or whatever. That person is actually um, has a long-term magical objective, even if he's actually uh, working it by doing good scientific work. <laughs> See, this is um, yeah. where uh, I'm glad we spoke about who you, you, the hypothetical audience for the book is. Obviously, people should read it. It's a fantastic book. But uh, what you were just saying about, say, the uh, the terminal cancer ritual is where I think the um, the model applies to Western cultures in the 21st century, but it doesn't, mm. in that exact example, it doesn't apply elsewhere where um, I think, and in fact, I could, and I have made the case, but I know what you mean, that magic mm. has a separate and entirely valid epistemology elsewhere, particularly when it mm. comes to medicine, where whatever it is, something like 60% yes. of our, so it's how you define magic, right? Because 60% of the medicines mm. that we use in the 21st century emerge from like the Amazon, where they are typically mm. found as uh, as plant allies in, a, in an existing magical culture. Yes. So when I read that, yes. it's good that we started with the audience, because I want to be clear to everyone that um, that's, this is who we're talking about, but elsewhere, and mm. it's it's one of the parts where maybe magic this is where this is my first hang on i can't uh, i can't go with the the sort of directional mm. fourfold thing until i realize actually yes mm. i can for that reason mm. that magic in we're talking about the presence of magic in in western cultures rather than yes. other cultures yes yeah i have um someone else's i, I think it was um phil hein has said that to me and i realized that you know i was writing from my experience yeah, um, magic as I experienced it in Britain, and to some extent, you know, um, what I've picked up from uh, Europe and um, further afield. But for instance, in South Africa, um, another reason not to talk too much about my interest in magic is that here it is very much about um, uh, witchcraft, sorcery. Um, uh, there are police departments. To deal with occult crime in South Africa, um, and um, you know, uh, people, children killed for their body parts, for their muti power, and that. And I realised that um, you know, whether my, my my whole view is incomplete, or whether it is perhaps a complete description <laughs> of a limited area, um, uh, that is a, definitely a limitation. Um, I like complete, and, complete description of a limited <laughs> area. That's an excellent yeah. way of thinking about it. Yes, that's it. Because I, I'm sort of drawing out some general principles, which I think have application wider. But um, I'm I'm very much aware that you know the limits that um they're they're within. Um, it's in, mm. okay. So that that's the, the South Africa experience is. Uh, illuminating for one of the uh, questions I have towards the end here, 
which is uh which i loved by the way and and this one mm. now kind of makes more sense when if you're thinking about a hypothetical audience that may also be in south africa you mm. uh, I'll, t- I'll turn it into a question how does a magician's attitude to power change over time if he or she's doing it right yes yes well um as I described it, and as I've sort of seen to my own life, is that very often one enters into a magic um, with a desire to gain powers. Um, uh, it may be that uh, you know life is sort of boring and cramped, and and you 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 see beyond things that could happen, and um, you want the power to make it happen. And I sort of parody that in. Um, I think it blasted your way to Megabucks, uh, where I said, I want to be rich, powerful, famous. Um, uh, wow, I've discovered this thing called magic, which enables me to be, become rich, powerful, and famous. Um, hey, I've just found out that the secret is, the first thing you have to do is to become perfect. Okay, what does that entail? Well, you know when you're perfect, when you no longer want to be rich, powerful, and famous. Oh, hell. <laughs> so um, the and I think it's true of a lot of the sort of spiritual paths of the um, East. You know, people sort of, uh, uh, I've just been reading the story of, um, God, I can't, won't get her name right. Um, the, the woman mystic who spent 12 years in a cave in the Himalayas. And um, people, uh, she spoke to many people who are sort of fascinated by the idea that they can, will learn to levitate. They can do, you know, have superpowers as a lama. But um, what she learned was that, uh, and and I remember this from very early on reading things like um, the early yogi texts, that these things are the distractions and actually you've got to go for something else. Now, um, what I found without being anything quite at that sort of high level is that my study of magic began with a desire to be able to do some things which the scientific world didn't allow me to do. But I actually do less of that sort of results magic as time passes. And I'm more and more really celebrating life as it is. Um, now, you see something like sort of demon work. Um, it's very helpful if you suffer from depression or, or some sort of demon to treat it as a demon and either invoke it or make a pact with it or, or sort of um, handle it using some of the traditional things of demonology. Um, and if you form a whole new relationship with it, which doesn't necessarily mean it goes away, but the relationship itself becomes very interesting. And so I find that, um, and I've said this sometimes to a group of sort of, you know, general witches or something. I've, um, I remember giving a talk in New Zealand and I said, you know, some of the people who've been doing magic for the longest time actually do less actual magic. And more of their rituals are a sort of celebration of what is. They tend to go towards seasonal rituals and things like that, a sort of celebration. In fact, to me, it's moving towards art in a sense. And I noticed that quite a few heads nod in the audience. And I think that's rather interesting. And I find that um, myself, when I come across something really troubling in the world, uh, part of me wants to transform it. You know, sort of um, people who are very right wing and, um, and aggressive and I think are sort of destroying politics. Um, part of me wants to sort of... <laughs> get them all in a, in a cave and drop a hand grenade in, you know, <laughs> absolutely furious about it, want to take action. But another part of me just sees how interesting it is, these patterns and these flows, and wants to um, sort of come to terms with them and gain a broader understanding of how all these different parts fit together. And that's, I suppose, is an example of what I mean by moving towards holism. Um, I think it's now, how true that is for everyone. I, I don't know, but there's certainly quite a lot of magicians can identify with that 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 feeling of uh, moving towards a, a sort of understanding of the whole rather than um, vigorously wanting to make changes here and there. 
And I think it's, uh, well, I certainly resonate with it. And I, I would include, you know, Crowley's last years in it when he stopped doing magic and, and realized he wasn't going to be physically a prophet of a new eon and was just kind of using the I Ching and, and just generally being an old mystic. And uh, I wonder mm. if, here's a question, because I resonate with it. I think what you've just described is the prize at the end or towards the end, or maybe even halfway of a magical career that you didn't know you were looking for and mm. probably couldn't have found elsewhere. So this is the sort of prize Lydell that you found after, you know, decades of magical experimentation mm. and exploration and thinking, which mm. had you gone in a religious mystic direction, it, it may not have resonated with you. Like, I don't think, I, I, I have tremendous resonance for, mm. resonance for a lot of kind of religious or spiritual mystic stuff now, but if I'd tried to mm. start there, it would not have happened. Oh, yes. I, I had to do, yes. I had to take the magic quadrant route or the magic direction. Mm. Yeah, yes. Yes, I think that's very true. And um, I, uh, in having to sort of um, uh, edit and prepare my, my, my Abramelin diary, um, I found that if 40 years later, I'm still learning things as I look back, um, you know, the exercise of sort of writing it up and trying to make sense of what happened, um, uh, illustrates that to some extent, because uh, I spent six months, as it were, hardening myself. And um, because of my, uh, you know, I wasn't really a theist and um, I was much more of a, a Taoist at the time, you know, and didn't really have a sense of a personal God, but um, much more of the sort of the flow of yin and yang through the universe and all that. Um, I had to do the, uh, you see, the wonderful thing about Abram Lin is it, it leaves it open. You know, if you're a pagan, do it your way. If you're a Christian, do it your way. If you're a Mohammedan, do it your way. If you're Jewish, do it your way. But if you're a person who doesn't have a personal God, um, what was my way? And so um, I, most of my practices were more on the lines of Crowley's eight lectures on yoga. In other words, stilling the mind, going for silence, going towards nothingness, rather than the, another approach I might have taken, which would have been to build up my visualization powers. You know, like in... Um, some Tibetan Buddhism where you picture these deities and all their complexity or the sort of um, golden dawn, down fortune thing where you, uh, W.E. Butler, where you practice visualizing until you can see more and more clearly. Um, instead, I was going towards minimizing, peeling off labels, stripping away. And um, that, you could say that I was actually doing it more as a mystic than as a magician, although I was actually doing a, a, you know, a magical ritual. And I think there's something in that, um, and to some extent that has colored my life since. Um, when it came to the point where I felt that I had completed, which for me was actually seven years later, um, the question was, you know, do I now get out the magic squares and try all that stuff? And I didn't want to. And um, it all seemed awfully sort of frothy to me compared with the relative state of silence and um, peace that I had achieved. And it's only really looking back, I realize in a sense then I was making a choice. What is it that magic offers to people? Why do people go from their everyday life to be interested in magic? And actually, I could see there are two big things that people go for one is an alternative um people who you know harry potter or kenneth grants outside the circles of time the idea that there's something out there which is bigger better different um in other words um at the very worst you could call it an escape from the chaos of no the normal what austin spare called it the other way is to try to stick with just what's around you, the everyday world, and discover the magic in it. And I realized that actually was the way, um, is this is with hindsight, you know, the way, my, the path of what I was trying to do. I was trying to show people that, I mean, like in um, uh, 
my book, uh, uh, you know, The Little Book of Demons, I begin with a really trite example. The tendency when the office copier starts breaking down, you start talking to it. Oh, come on, you stupid bloody thing. How do you know? You know how, I'm in a hurry. Can't you sense that? You know, you start talking to it. Now, if anyone catches you doing that, or uh, you think about it, you saying, how stupid, you know, it's just a dumb machine. But I say, no, actually, that tendency to personalize things, the life around you, and to speak to them and, and try to and think that they're being bitchy or whatever, is a very deep and natural human ability. What can one do with it? You know, and then I lead it into sort of the, the whole thing of personifying life and, and um, the magical way of treating the world as, as a world with spirits behind it. Um, so that sort of approach is very fundamental, I realize, in nearly all the things I've written. Um, how instead of presenting what one might call an escape to another world, which is a marvelous thing to do. I mean, you know, I realize, say, if I look at Kenneth Grant, I couldn't actually do what, he, what he's done. Um, uh, I had very limited experience with drugs. You know, I had psilocybin mushrooms, and it was amazing and very valuable to me. But um, the, I've sometimes described to people that, you see, you can get in an airplane and you can fly to another country and suddenly you're in a warm climate and everything's different and it's all fantastic and wonderful. Um, but you come back to your ordinary life and it seems even more ordinary and boring in comparison. Now, when I, before I did the Abramelian, I was working in a great big open plan office as a um, computer programmer um, and people were just all around and it was just most deadly boring thing i can imagine and there was one person we used to laugh at because he would sit at his desk um none of us had enough work to do and he would spend all his time looking at travel brochures and he would have one holiday in january every year when you go to some exotic place and he'd spend the rest of the year dreaming about it and showing people photographs and telling everyone about it and we all laughed at him and thought god you know what, a, what an idiot but i thought no what he's doing is amazing He's coping with this boring life in a way that I can't. It's driving me crazy, but he can just have his dream of his faraway holiday and um, he can live his whole life happily just having that dream. And I think that, so there's very valid um, the sort of magic where um, you have a beyond, an outer thing, a different world, which is, um, uh, you know, which if you can spend part of the time in that world, then uh, life becomes bearable. For me, that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> it just makes ordinary life seem even worse. And so the whole approach of um, uh, finding the, you know, the world in a grain of sand, that sort of uh, looking at the ordinary around you and, and trying to make it th things you can do that make it come to life and sparkle and become vivid and interesting. Um, uh, going back to what I was just saying, you know, these patterns in life, which some of them are pretty tiresome and, and pretty unpleasant, um, instead seeing them as a sort of great weaving of a great game. And, uh, you know, yes, like watching a game, you know, okay, you lose a pawn, but what is that as part of the whole process that is going on? Um, uh, that was sort of the, the direction I took. And I'm only really realizing it. 40 years later when i um start to write up those notes well that is the best possible place to uh to to wind this up i was riveted i think that was uh some uh mystic truth bombs we've uh we've got the <laughs> lionel that was uh amazing so uh obviously mm. i will have um the uh the youtube channel and the book linked up in the show notes but for people who want oh, to know yes. more uh where where else should they go um well i have actually started a website um uh, ramseydukes.co.uk but i haven't <laughs> i haven't quite got it working yet um you know i i've got a sort of meet me um i haven't discovered how to put all my books onto it and things yeah. like that but um i better do that quickly if this is going to go out see how how much further i can get with it and Fantastic. then eventually i can write a blog putting a few thoughts from time to time yeah um, nice one that's it mm. all right well uh it's always oh, a the pleasure. youtube channel 
Yes, uh, I'll, the I'll YouTube have that. channel. That's you got I, that. Oh yes, I will. I'll have says. that. I watch every video. Mm. Uh, mm. Oh great! Yeah. I will. Um, yeah. I will certainly have them linked up. And Lionel, mm. it's always a pleasure. The book is fantastic. Mm. Listening to you talk is fantastic. So thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure for me too. All right, then. Magic is post-science, attitudes to power, existentialism, and the Enlightenment. It's all good. For the chaos magic nerds out there, my year of magical thinking does double service because it fills out some of the history around the formation of some of our cornerstone texts. This, in addition to being the observations of a magician with many decades of practice. I commend it to you. I also commend subscribing to podcasts to you, either on YouTube or in your favorite podcatcher. And whilst I don't entirely commend Twitter to you, I do commend finding me on it, where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.